anyways. So, um, I actually, I don't completely remember how we got on the subject, but we're talking about kind of the differences of justice and mercy a little bit. Um, and I, I know one thing, in fact, maybe let's share this real quick just to kind of get started. Um, oh, I'll have that up. Is Alma 42 is I, it's one of my favorite chapters, actually. Um, I think it's a good one. It has a lot of good stuff in it. Um, maybe it's because I can relate to being a wicked son, maybe. Uh, hopefully that's not it, but anyways. Oh, <laughs> I know I can definitely relate to that, but anyways. <laughs> um, well, anyways, I, I'm part any, of being silly than anything. And partly, but honestly, and partly honestly any of us can, any of us can relate on a certain yes. level, uh, on a certain level to, uh, having to repent and come back from sin yes yeah yes yep that, that is a very good point there ben um mm -hmm. so it's not just me um putting myself down but yeah. anyways so on, on the difference between justice and mercy this is i think a, an important uh verse so this mm -hmm. is alma 42 so this is alma the elder speaking to one of his sons and this is uh his more wayward son also just a little tidbit here there is um a tradition at passover since we're kind of we're just kind of ending that theme in fact this is the holy convocation after unleavened bread today right okay yeah. it's the sabbath uh, right mm -hmm. after um so it's a little late but um during passover there is a tradition that fathers give their sons advice and in the traditional Satyrs, uh, there's four sons for the four different types, where here, Alma the Elder has, I mean, Alma the Younger has three sons. Yeah. But I'm making a connection that I do believe this was given during Passover time, okay? Um, as in to go with the holiday that we're just kind of ending. But mm -hmm. um, here is the one that I want to bring up. What do you suppose that mercy can rob justice? I say unto you, nay, not one whit. If so, Elohim would cease to be Elohim. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There, there... So I think I think what started the conversation originally was um, Ben. I think he he brought up uh, a question. Something yeah, right. something that I'd seen. Something that I'd seen on Facebook. This idea of that uh, mercy, uh, that justice is mercy for the uh, victim which i which i do believe which i do believe to be a mistake i did not like said thing i do i don't believe that that is necessarily true uh it didn't sound right especially um uh, but i but i wanted to but i wanted to know people's thoughts here about it uh, sure sure i think um probably a good thing um probably one place to start is let's, let's actually just go look at the dictionary <laughs> yeah um so let's go mercy here yeah. mercy. just to kind of get a good idea what mercy is right because um I, I i would say that comment or the idea that you saw on facebook is not correct and hopefully maybe we can look through this through the scriptures and kind of prove that out okay but i i think a good place is a good start is the dictionary i i mm. like the dictionary um because for one, this is 1828. So the definitions uh, during Joseph Smith's time, um, but it helps us remember the definitions that we don't use on a regular basis that we may think of in, in a certain context, but we don't think of it in other contexts. And so we get kind of in our rut of habits, which mm -hmm. there's good and bad to that, right? But anyways, but I think it's good to remind us what the definitions are. So, um, mercy, number one, uh, the beloved benevolence. benevolence. <laughs> I just had to, uh, yeah, benevolence, mildness, or tenderness of heart, which disposes a person to overlook injuries. So e even just that right there, because if justice is the um, those that got hurt. Mercy, right? Giving them mercy. 
but here's mercy overlooking, overlooking the injuries. Overlooking so why the injury. would they need that? Mm -hmm. If right. justice was a fulfillment of mercy, right? Um, now, this is just going off the dictionary definitions right now, but anyways. We're going off the dictionary definitions right now. Mercy and forgiveness go hand in hand. Yes. Yeah. Um, oops. There's my drunkardness. <laughs> um, anyways. Uh, or to treat an offender better than he deserves. Oh. Mm -hmm. Uh, that also okay. kind of that actually works against, against justice. Against, against the justice. idea, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the because justice is justice requires that we get exactly what we deserve. Yes, correct. That's yep. scary. Um, yes, I will be honest. I don't want justice, although I deserve it. Um, right, um, and so I want to endure to the end under Yeshua's authority and, and cloak that i i won't get justice because I, I like I don't this want it, it says the disposition that tempers justice and induces an injured person to forgive trespasses and injuries and to forbear punishment yeah so um i, I think the more we're even just reading the definition one it kind of negates the idea that's being pushed on Facebook, right? Yes. Or inflict less than the law or justice would warrant, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, on this, I would agree with that, but there are probably at least one exception that I can think of off the top of my head. Someone who slays another man, that man must be slain or woman, right? Um, mm. That one is stayed out right out. In, in the, the law. law yes yes in the law that that one if you is, kill you shall be killed yes correct um, unless you run away to a city of refuge yeah uh, yes well, so city actually, of refuge is not law. murder though that one's more accident and, and so this one so you're saying has, more like manslaughter yes manslaughter right. okay um I, I i mean even just thinking out loud there are some exceptions to that um, even within the scriptures, but it, in, we got to be careful with them, right? I'll, I'll say that. We definitely have to be well, careful with the exceptions on that one. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so it does get it does get kind of messy. Yeah, it's just there. There's a curse if we don't take care of that. Um, so, anyways, so in this sense, there is perhaps no word or language precisely synonymous with mercy that which comes nearest to its grace it implies mm. benevolence tenderness mildness pity or compassion and clemency, clemency but exercised only towards offenders mercy is distinguishing attribute of the supreme being yeah and just I mean. in the definition right there that totally contradicts with the idea that's being pushed on facebook uh, Correct. That you pointed out earlier, Ben. That that right there, in that definition, and that's that's not even a holy book, right? <laughs> <laughs> that 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 contradicts that idea right there. Yeah, just yeah. The, just the, the definition. definition, just the very so, definition. Of mercy. The the Lord's long is long suffering of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing, clearing the, guilty. the guilty. So. Um, numbers oh numbers hmm. yeah yep, let's actually just because it's uh referencing the law torah let's go look at it real quick so um numbers 14 18 and yahweh is long-suffering and of great mercy forgiving iniquity and trans transgression and by no means clearing the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children upon the third and fourth generation so i do want to comment about this last part here a lot of that has to do with um 
it's the children are keep doing the false traditions or the iniquitous traditions of the fathers. And that's why the curses are keep being upon the multiple gener generations. As in, I don't remember it's here or somewhere else. Yahweh does say that he forgives those who come to him, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think they're negating each other. And I think this is just more going along the lines who the children who keep doing the iniquity of the fathers are um and that generally does happen for three or four generations that's kind of a i think you can yeah. kind of pull that out and yeah. that's technically that's technically why a lot of people are waking up now yeah to, we're, we're in that third fourth generation right now we're, we're yeah fourth going into fifth technically but still <laughs> yeah generation is kind of a vague term i think yeah. but yes it's in that but, range so, did you want to say something yeah. too well, I'm just, I'm in a first generation. I, I was, my parents didn't have anything to do with Joseph Smith. <laughs> uh, right. Well, um, my, I, I don't know how many generations it is, but I, I do know um, my ancestors were pioneers. So um, I, 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 I was never into genealogy, so I can't give you the number, but it's, I know a lot of people, it's around those three or four, five generations. Yeah, I'm, I'm four generations removed from my uh, from the uh, on my mom's side from the first uh, member from the first members in the family. Now four on my on my dad's side of the family, he he was first generation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, but it's the culture. It's the mm -hmm. cultural pattern of the three or four generations. Yeah. 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 I can see that. I I can go with that. Um, but anyways, okay, so let's go back to the dictionary. Um, assuming we want to read more dictionary definitions, I think it's been... I think I think mercy's been pretty well defined. Yeah, okay, well, this one's not really adding much. You know, exercise of mercy or favor. Pity was in the first one. Clemency and bounty, that was in the first one. Charity. Charity. Now, that one was not in the first one. No, um... I, 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 so this one can get a little tricky because um, sometimes in, in the scriptures, charity is um, translated from a Hebrew word, which actually means keep the commandments. But right. I also know that Gentiles use it as in meaning love. And so, um, and well, I think a lot of that a, comes into the play where like the greatest example of religion, pure religion, is... Right um extending mercy or love to the fatherless and the widows right yes mm -hmm. which has a lot to do with what charity organizations do is giving them money uh, which is not everything that needs to be done but is a, a a big part that needs to be done especially the widows right i mean you see right, that in the right. first part of acts and a whole bunch of other places it's all through it, it's also it, it's also uh the it, it's also a large part of Isaiah. The the um, many of the offenses that they are uh, that are levied that are leveled at the uh, people of Judah are that they're not taking care of the widows and fatherless. They're not no. giving. You know, justice. I find something interesting. So I read that verse, right, Matthew chapter nine, verse thirteen. Okay. Um, the whole verse, not just the selected portion that they put in there. Okay. And it says, but go ye and learn with what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so charity has a lot to do with calling people to repentance. And that's what I'm getting from that. Verse, I can right? definitely see that, um, mm -hmm. especially with what I know what charity means in, in Hebrew. Um, right. Because it has to do with repentance or Doing or it's keeping good. righteousness, which is repenting, right? So that that right. completely it's makes it sense to me. I'm not going to try to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll leave that to Ben. He's good at that. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, per, uh, pronouncing is not my strong point. 
<laughs> punctuation. Uh, not always, not always mine either. But hey, well, it's good that we have you, somebody you know here the, who can do it. You know what the interest? You know what the interesting thing about that word tzedika is? It's actually in the name of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Yeah. Oh, Gotta, yeah. Okay. King of righteousness, right? Yeah. That makes yeah. okay. That actually makes. That's so the, why that he Hebrew the word translated to charity is actually in the name of Melchizedek. Yeah, um, <laughs> and that's why he was over the land of peace because righteousness is what causes peace, right? Right, yes. right. Um, which actually goes back to peacemakers. Peacemakers are those who teach the way of the peace master, so that way he. Well, that's be... where that's where peace comes from. Yeah, and true joy is living the law. And that's where we find our peace. That's where we find our safety. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have hard times and we're not going to wade through our share of afflictions, but we can have peace, the peace of knowledge that we are living the law and that right, we right. are. Well, and it's, it's easier because at right. the same time, you know that he will take care of us, even though mm -hmm. uh, we will still go through trouble times, right? There, right. Is abs there is absolutely no peace like knowing that your life is that Acceptable. Yahweh is pleased that Yahweh is pleased with your life. There is no peace that is as great as knowing that. And in fact, on lectures on faith six, um, teaches that that's actually how the ancients could go through with go through what they went through is because they had that peace from Yahweh. Yeah. I was always, you know, I, I was always wondering about that, you know, when I read like in the Book of Mormon, like the people of Alma, like when they were enslaved and they were told you can't pray out loud. And, you know, they, just, they were just really being hounded and their lives can't have been easy or, or pleasant, per se. Uh, under the public. dictatorship of the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> under the dictatorship of you know, the people they were living under. But then they had the peace knowing that, hey, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And and they were blessed. Their burdens were lightened and they had mm -hmm. peace and they were even kind of happy. <laughs> well, contrast and then, and contrast that. that. Or contrast joyous. That. I, I think a better word for that is joyous because happy, I think, is a is a worldly yeah for for joy yeah. but but con contrast that with the people of limpi yes who didn't have that peace and no. who kept trying to win their freedom by their own merits yeah their own way their own ideas mm -hmm. by sheer their force of their own will yeah didn't their work. own strength didn't work yeah that yeah. I, I just want to say also they also they also experienced quite a bit more misery. Correct. Oh, yes. And what great. actually freed them is when they used the wine, which is symbolic of the atonement. Mm -hmm. um, and they also and they also humbled themselves. They had to humble themselves. Right, which is um, actually a requirement to receive the atonement is to become humble yes. and contrite. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. Broken heart. Broken heart. heart and <laughs> yeah, in fact, the Book of Mormon makes it clear that that's required for that it's that's humble, needed uh, for even as a the child to yes. be effective, right? Which is yeah, repentance. The, the ends the ends of the law cannot be answered except for those who have broken heart and contrite spirit. spirit. Yes, yeah? that's correct. Which mm -hmm. in in Second Nephi twenty five, that's all we can do is have that, that broken is heart and contrite do. spirit. That's that all we can all do, we can do. Mm -hmm. and. And the Book of Mormon states that in, in different ways, in that all we can do is repent, which it's the same thing, right? It's mm. just different words, different way to describe it. Um, but anyway, I thought all we could do was pay our tithing and do go to service projects. And oh, my bad. Go to the temple. Um, go wrong to the church, temple. wrong scriptures. Oh, my bad, my bad, my bad. <laughs> no, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, I, I know what you're doing. Don't to, it's the same culture I grew up in. Don't forget yeah. to don't for, don't forget to go to big stone buildings. Yeah, oh, yeah. Which yeah. Uh, oh, anyways. 
Yeah. Uh, on a we're regular day. Track. We're getting off track now. Yes, we're getting yeah, off yeah, track. Track. We're, we're getting <laughs> off track. Here. Okay. So let's get back on track. Grace. Oh, so charity. Okay. We just talked about that. Grace, mm -hmm. that, that was in there. Eternal yeah. life. I, I mean, that's the fruit of mercy, right? Okay. Yes, so, that's the fruit of mercy. Yes. Um part, part of just on, on, on that fruit of the mercy, because um Sermon on the Mount, I forget which <laughs> chapter, but it might be five, but you know, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven, right? That's I think right. a lot yeah. of what that or, one's going off of. I mean, it has second Timothy, five. but anyways. Yeah, yeah, it's five. That's five. Five. Yeah, that's Matthew five. So there's yeah, yeah. Okay, so Matthew five. Pardon that that goes along with what we read in number one. Yeah. The act of sparing, forbearance <laughs> of violence, act expected the prisoner cry for mercy. Okay, so pretty much it was all said in number one, right? Except for the charity a little bit, but I I I mean, anyways. That, that one's an interesting one that we already went over that. So now let's go to justice. Okay. Yes. Um, do you want to read this one, Josh? Sure. Ah, I find it interesting. It's listed as a virtue. Anyways, the virtue, which consists in giving to everyone what is his due. Whatever that is. Practical conformity well, to I, on that. To, I, the one thing that I would say that where that's a, a virtue is you're not being a respecter of persons, right? No, it's even across the board. It's do. even across the board. Correct. It's right. according to what they happen rather than you giving favorites that we see in the world all over the place and everything. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Practical conformity to the laws and to principles of rectitude. In the dealings of men with each other, honesty, oh, I love that, integrity, oh, I love that word, in commerce or mutual intercourse. Justice is distributive or commutative. Distributive justice belongs to magistrates or rulers and consists in distributing to every man that right or equity which the laws and the principles of equity require. Or, okay, so, okay, maybe go finish the or statement, but I want to say- Yeah, something. or in deciding controversies according to the laws and to principles of equity. So um, in the law, and, and we talked a little bit about this on 3rd Nephi 5, but in the law, talks about mercy. <laughs> the law, Torah, actually talks about mercy. And that, um, and what to do when it happens, and so to to me, this is bringing out how justice takes in accordance that. In fact, um, there was the honesty. Justice has to do with honesty and integrity. Um, and integrity, and what happens when you repent? You're being honest and integrity, and you try to take care of it you're, yourself. You're telling the truth. Yeah, that's honesty. And yep. integrity, you do what you can to take care of it. In fact, mm -hmm. when you do repent, right, you don't need a judge to say you have to do this. You start doing it on your own as you can, right? As in one of well, my favorite examples, that is Alma the Younger. Yes. And if you're truly and if you're truly humble, right, you are driven that that you are driven to be honest with yourself. And to say, hey, you know, I can do this better and I need to repent of this and I need to cut this out of my life and I need to include this into my life and and live the law more fully. But since and since the thing is, is that uh, since many of us have trouble being honest with ourselves, sometimes a good friend who will be honest with us is a useful commodity mm -hmm. in helping us to. Uh, <laughs> yes um bringing and bringing that to and helping us to bring that to light yes yes mm -hmm. it is um it, we all have things that we have problems letting go like i i i talked about one uh while we were doing sacrament that josh helped me out with uh, and letting go and not sharing things that are not always going the way that one would hope right um mm -hmm. and so I, I i thank you for giving me courage on that josh um it, it's hard to 
admit you don't have everything that you have it the way that you want it to be and that you need help. It can be hard. It's well, it's been hard for me. I can tell you that. that oh, you know. It's hard for me too, but you helped me with that. Yeah. I'm, I'm well, grateful for that. Um, but what, one thing also look in rectitude and dealings with men with each other, justice has mm -hmm. to do dealing I correctly with men and when you actually repent and receive the mercy what are you doing you're actually dealing correctly with men after that point which is the whole point of justice mm -hmm. right and so yes. i i think I, I mean we need to keep reading but i i think looking deeper even in some of these definitions of, of mm -hmm. the word justice gives more insights to the alma 42 how justice does not rob mercy personally right. no right. or mercy neither mercy justice correct i, I might have said that wrong sorry about that I no 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 no, no no it's it's it's, it's sorry. It, it, you can use really you can use them interchangeably because neither one can but, rob yeah, that's the other. true but but yeah. ben actually said the one i meant though I, I, oh okay <laughs> to, yeah. uh, 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 what what can I say? I looked at it about ten minutes ago. I still remember it. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, right. I, All right, there, pack. I, I need to work on my short term <laughs> memory. Apparently, <laughs> it's my. So finishing out that paragraph, it says commutative justice <clears throat> consists in fair dealing, in trade, and mutual intercourse between man and man. Yeah. So yeah. intercourse. Um, anciently, maybe not too anciently, but it used to mean um talking with each other and, and doing things with each other it doesn't have quite the same context back then as it does it, in today's world it's, it's basically it's, in something completely different yes yes well it, it actually it still means it used to mean but m most people connect it with the other uh meaning, meaning of the uh, word. yes yes the other yes, meaning the other of the word. word correct yes <laughs> The, the um, more modern uh, connotation to that word, yes. Or, or, or the more modern default uh, yes. usage yeah. of it, anyway. Yeah, yeah. That, that's probably more, more correct. Yeah. In part, yeah. it, number number the, two. Um, the more so, modern dominant thesis in society. Yeah, that's a good yes. way of putting it, too. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. I, I, just in my deep uh, programming um, background, I like the default. Board for you know, it, but anyways, the same thing you mentioned right. earlier, Stephen, mm -hmm. that justice is even across the board, and that's the second definition right here is impartiality. Oh, is oh okay, yeah, so I guess I'm not too crazy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you're not, you're not crazy at all. So it's impartiality. <laughs> what you know, you you get what you've what you deserve, right? What you've I, earned. I mean, so this. In the scriptures, it talks about how we're going to get rewarded according to our works, right? Right. And, and yes. this is where um, a lot of people will get tripped up on on that because we're saved by grace and mercy, and I am not denying that. But right. there is a portion after that that we are we then are rewarded according to our works because yes, Dean C seventy six talks about the different degrees of glory, degrees, not kingdoms. And then uh, 1 Corinthians 15 also talks about the three different degrees of glory. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then also, uh, one of my favorite parables is the parable of the sower. Mm -hmm. there's, yes. there's four degrees, and that actually, to me, goes along with three degrees of glory and sons of perditions, where there is no glory. And you can see that there also. And, and other parables, even the parable of the talents, I can see it too. But anyways, yes. th th there is, there's both. And I think a lot of people get tripped up on how they think it's only one or the other. It's not. It's both. Well, they work, they, they're, well, they're, uh, separate I, thing, well, they're separate things, but one cannot be without the other. And one thing that I have noticed is that in a lot of these things, and a lot of these things where uh, all of us Christians get into these fights about, well, either it's this or it's that, and then when you actually look into it deeper, it's actually both. Yeah. Like that. Yes. yeah and that's yeah, what I was just trying to bring out. Neither, it's, one, it's neither one can operate on its own merits. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, so, I think but, on this case, like at least the case that I brought up, it, it, it is both because first of all, first and foremost, we're saved because of Yeshua's grace, period, and absolutely. what he did for us. But at the same time, even in the Sermon on the Mount, it talks about, um, in fact, let's let's go get that, okay? Because this is, it, yeah. this one's a big deal. Um, so Matthew 5. Yep. Uh, and it's Matthew around 5, the seven. word heaven. Uh, and the one I want is, okay, so let's just start here. Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. We're not going to talk about that because that's a whole other can of worms. But anyways, <laughs> but anyways <laughs> to till heaven and earth pass away one jot, no, nor one tittle shall in no wise pass away from the law, Torah, until all shall be fulfilled. So, um, I, I, I mean, I know it's dark for me right now, but when I went outside earlier today, I still saw heaven and earth. So I, I don't know about you guys, but anyways. Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> last time I checked. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> whosoever, therefore, this is, I think this is the verse I want. Breaketh shall break one of the least. Uh, there's this double clicking issue that I get because of the different programs. Sorry about that. Oh. The, one of these, the least commandment shall teach men and, and shall, teach. shall teach men to do so. He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. So this is, oh, let me finish it. But whosoever shall do, do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So even in this verse right here, at least the way I see it, it's seeing different degrees in heaven. Yeah. So Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. And the greatest, right there. The least and great. Yep. Uh, which I see in First Corinthians fifteen and D and C seventy six, uh, and it's one heaven, not multiple heavens. In fact, I mean, you go look at the Beatitudes part of this part, right? That the meek shall mm -hmm. inherit the earth. I do believe yep. earth is going to be that place, literally, not figuratively, but literally. But anyways, we're sidetracking a little bit. Let's go back to the dictionary definition. <laughs> um, no, there was, so there was something that was... Oh, go ahead. There's, there was something interesting that I was looking at on three, that word equity. Okay. And mm -hmm. that word equity, we see it a lot in the Doctrine and Covenants in association with the law of consecration. Okay. Do you have a... Uh, verse we want to go look at off the top of your head? <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, I don't exactly have the uh, scripture. Oh, that's verse. fine. Well, well, we can use the topical guide. I, I know it's not perfect, but it is. it does an okay job. And if we can't get it there, we can use my program. Um, Let's go law of concept. Uh, Kirtland, Kirtland is where they really... So if you were to search for... Uh, I, I, I do, I will say this, that the law of consecration is tithing. Um, yeah. Because mm -hmm. it, whenever it's described and everything it's describing is tithing. Not to mention that DNC 119, which is the law on tithing, says it's a standing law forever. Meaning it's never going to change. <laughs> right? Um, and I, I, I don't want to sidetrack us on that, but we could if you wanted to. Because that, that's tithing actually is the subject that woke me up. Um, so, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it doctrine and covenant section, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't see like equity in the topical guide. So, let's, 105, 105, okay. it talks, it, it doesn't exactly mention the word equity, but it does talk about, um, it does, how he wants them to deal with giving out the land and gathering the resources for that it's it's talking it, it talks more about unity in 105 not so much equity but that's we can't it, a lot of times uh equity and justice brings unity and unity and spirit so well, uh if we want we can search use my program to search for equity because the topical guide had nothing well it's um, more about equity, <laughs> of course 
try equal equal mm. um okay so all right let's go let's just do topical guide real quick in fact some i i wonder let's just go look at the um index because sometimes that uh has more uh, let, let's how just can we, how can if we cannot be equal wait wait oh no okay there you go so equal equity so there it is well it equal, wasn't in the top of equity guide, so let, let's see if one of these are let's, ones that you want to look at uh let's um, see well church of the firstborn but that that, that doctrine that's, and covenant that's 78 a, Doctrine and Covenant 78. Okay, well, let's go there then. And uh, that's, uh, let's see. I'll well, start. The, the verse that they of... started was, that they highlighted was five, but did you say you wanted to start it somewhere else? Uh, let's start up at the beginning. Uh, okay. And, and the Lord spake unto Joseph Smith Jr., saying, Hearken unto me, and saith the Lord your God, who, who are ordained unto the high priesthood of my church, who have assembled yourselves together and listen to the counsel of him who has ordained you from on high, who will speak uh, in your I, ears. I just want to say, uh, where did the ordination happen from? From on high. high. Yeah. high. Not well, speak. As in on high as in from heaven, as in from Yahweh's own voice. I mean, not from, from some man laying his hands on your head and saying, uh, voila, you got it. Yeah, We're exactly. Seeing. That is exactly what I mean. And I have a resource page on that. <laughs> Who shall speak in your ears the words of wisdom, that salvation may be unto you in that thing which you have presented before me, saith the Lord. For verily I say unto you, the time has come and is now at hand, and behold and lo, it must needs be that there is an organization of my people in regulating oh, wait, and establishing. Wait, wait, wait. I, I just want to be organization, meaning there's leaders. Yeah. In regulating and establishing the affairs of the storehouse for the poor of my people, both in this place and in the land of Zion. So for that permanent... definitely goes back to Malachi 3 and taking care of the poor, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. For a permanent and everlasting establishment and order oh, oh, onto wait, my church. Oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What is permanent? Uh, that means it doesn't permanent doesn't, I think that means I think that means the same thing as it meant uh, when they said that the uh, um, when the it says that the Passover are forever. Is, yeah, that the Passover is forever. Yeah, I think permanent forever, same thing kind of thing. Oh, okay, all right. I just want to make sure we're and, uh, and, <laughs> no permanent is a temporary forever. And well, everlasting. Okay, but they, but they <laughs> hey look, but they 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 verify that statement in the next word. Oh, okay. And everlasting. Like permanent and everlasting. Oh, dang it. <laughs> it's right yeah, there. Yeah, I thought it was a temporary forever, man. And, and order unto my church to advance the cause, which ye have espoused to the salvation of man and to the glory of your father who is. Oh, okay, so that, right here, I want to say this is talking about the temporal salvation. Of yeah. the, yes, uh, this is definitely the this is definitely talking about temporal salvation. Okay, I, um, I just want to make that clear uh, in case. Well, no, that's what question. I got out of it because they're talking about the storehouse here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and so, I, I'm just trying to make it clear for those who may not be on the same yes, page. Right. Yeah, got it, got it, got it. That you may be equal in the bonds of heavenly things, yea, and earthly things also. See, this law is all about justice for the obtaining of heavenly things. For if ye are not equal in earthly things, ye cannot be equal in obtaining heavenly things. You know, I, I just want to pause right there. You know, I, without us looking at this together, I would have never have thought tithing was tied to justice. Mm-hmm. But with while well, we were just talking about tithing and and or I mean just talking about justice and mercy and how justice was bringing out equity and now here's been bringing out equal equity with tithing, it makes yep. sense. I but I would have never tied that together on my own. So I think that was a good point that been brought out. So now let's so now let's tie it all let's tie it all together with a bow tie. Here. <laughs> okay. Or if you wear will, that I. <laughs> For if you will that I give unto you a place in the celestial world, you must prepare yourselves by doing the things which I have commanded you and required of you. You mean it's a, a gospel of doing and becoming and not just thinking about? <laughs> 
a lot of thinkers. I mean, out there, the, the, I'm you. Well, I mean, the whole thing is the whole thing is, is this whole principle is based into justice. Everybody has the equal opportunity to be able to take care of their families if they will be industrious. Right. That's the whole well, that's the whole purpose of having our inheritances given to us at, by by the, uh, from the bishops an opportunity whereby we can be able to do to t- to do those things where uh, that uh, so everybody gets an equal opportunity to to go along with this and so i think there's a lot of confusion about tithing so but i think to add to this is part of the tithing is there's multiple laws that go along with the the law of tithing um, mm-hmm. One is the the farmer who should not reap the corner of his fields, as it's stated in, in Torah, but which basically means don't take everything up, right? Right. Mm-hmm. But in that, um, he leaves some behind for those who are less fortunate than him to go gather up because it was a blessing from Yahweh to him, and he then gives some of it back to um those who are in his image right but what i'm trying to bring out here yahweh doesn't bless us unless we do our part and here's an example that deals with tithing that's on the subject that we're kind of on right now that mm-hmm. unless you do your part are you gonna be quiet in here you um don't get because in your part is just to go gather not necessarily um the raising and planting and caring for the crop but your part in the poor is doing the actual gathering right right well here's here's oh, here's no, hold, here's hold on one second i just want to pause one second okay oh, wouldn't that be good okay you wanted to say something josh i did and going along with what you were saying and what we've been talking about this whole time perfect example of that type of society happened on the American continent after Jesus Christ came and visited the Nephites. Well, the people, not just the Nephites, but the people in general. Yeah, because it was a mixture of Nephites and Lamanites, right? Right, 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 right. So in 4th Nephi, verse 3, because there's only Mm -hmm. one chapter really in 4th Nephi, (laughs) uh, in verse 3, it says, and they had all things, well, I'll go up a little bit further. We'll start in verse 2. And it came to pass in the 30 and 6th year, the people were all converted unto the Lord upon all the face of the land, both Nephites and Lamanites. And there were no contentions or disputations among them. And every man did deal justly Ah, one with another. And they had all things common among them. Therefore, now we're talking, we're talking tithing now. Therefore, they were not rich um, and poor. Bond I, I will say, food. I'm going to interrupt you just real quick. I've mm-hmm. done studies and I have a post planned. I haven't finished it yet. I, I never <laughs> say anything like that, right? But all things in common actually does point to tithing. And I can show that from the scriptures. But anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But bond and free, but they were all made free and partakers of the heavenly gift. And that's beautiful. So... Right. What we have here is we have a case, a perfect case in point in the Book of Mormon of where mercy and justice met and worked together. And we had a perfect, harmonious society on earth at one time. And God was trying to restore it again uh, soon. Right. And, and I, I do like how um, this is bringing out how it's the justice and, and mercy and mm-hmm. how that there were no rich and poor because those who had more were taking care of those who had less, right? Right, right. And it wasn't a simple matter. It wasn't a matter of people saying, oh, that person's lazy. They're trying to get one over on us. Because no, that's no. where the pride comes in, right? This Correct. is where the pride comes in. I, I, and I think one thing to keep in mind on that is that we all have different gifts, right? And, and the hand should not say to the foot i have no need of you right right exactly we all have need of each other because the hand will fall over into the dirt that's true (laughs) but but well besides that we all have need of each other 
Mm-hmm. Because no man can achieve salvation on his own. Well, right. I think a child, careful. whatever, no person can achieve salvation on their own. Yeah, because we all need Yeshua. Yes. Um, and Yeshua has said we all need each something? other. Correct. I think yes. Sue wanted to say something. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Sue. Uh, well, when you were talking about how we actually had a society on earth that was living all that for a short time, yes. Yes, for um, a short time. For, for it, it was a drop in the bucket, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I've yeah. been doing it for a very long time. But it Who? is possible. Other rights. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, I, 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 I said what I needed to say, but I have to leave because I have an early start tomorrow. Uh, as usual, I love fellowshipping with you all, and uh, I'll see you, Anon. All right. Well, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom. Buddy. Shalom. Shalom. <laughs> we'll pause for a minute. Okay. Okay. So a great question was brought up the, about the name of Christ. How do we come under it? What does that mean? What name are we coming under? Those kinds of things. So let's so let's explore that. I was actually going to the Webster's Dictionary, yeah. 1828 oh. Webster's Dictionary, to uh, talk and to, to look up the definition of name. Sure. So can... And I have another one that we I actually my turnaround post talks about this some. So I want to look at that a little bit also. Yeah, that let's yeah, let's good. let's definitely let's get into that. So here's the here okay. It's um okay, so here are the here let's start with the uh let's start with the definitions. One that by which a thing is called. Uh, we take that name. We take that name upon us when we are, when we uh, we take and we take this definition of the name of Christ upon us when we're baptized. That uh, by which a thing is called, the letters and characters written or engraved, expressing the sounds by which a person or thing is known and distinguished, a person, a reputation or character. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, uh, Having there, this mm-hmm. one's key right there. In, in my Reputa- opinion, that you're taking his character. It's to take his character upon you. And the way, the only way to do that is through obedience and walking in the path that he walked. Well, and the reason that obedience is key to that is because it's obedience to his law, which he himself mm-hmm. kept. And it's how he, um, uh, what's the word? It's how he directed himself is the law, mm-hmm. right? He kept the law. He was sinless, right? And so everything mm-hmm. he did was according to what he gave us. Um, and, it, and definition eight is another important definition as well. Yes. And that is authority. authority. Um. In very fact, important these two definitions goes along with hebrew idioms along with the word name name in hebrew deals with your reputation and character and the authority um and uh, do we want to read more on this one is on the dictionary or is that let's clear? go into the scripture let's go into the scriptures on this oh, okay well um on that line i do oh actually let's So um, just for those who want it, we can look at it more later because sometimes it's it's helpful to look at it more contemplatively yourself later. But anyways, um, we, we can go through all of this, but there's there's a passage in here from the Book of Mormon. I bring out how it's talking about the character when it's using the word name and it's probably yeah it's this one right here yep right here mosiah yeah mosiah five yeah um so zach actually you want to um spend some time reading a little bit and then um 
we can all interject when we want to say something. Okay. And it shall come to pass that whoever, whosoever doeth this shall be found at the right hand or de designation of Elohim. For you shall know the name or character by which he is called. Okay, so I, I just want to, so um, when we looked at the word name, in fact, you go look at here, uh, you go look at the bottom, the, the, the link I'm actually giving for the, for this, for my justification for putting character in here, it actually is the dictionary, 1828 dictionary of definition of name as which we just saw, right? Oops, I guess I got rid of it. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, right here, right? Character. Reputation. Reputation is what you're known by, what people, how they talk about you, right? How you're called, mentioned as. And under, and so, so it, just to give some uh, oh. preamble, just to give some preamble, this that they're talking about, and it shall come to pass that whosoever doeth this in verse 9. It's all of you that have entered into a covenant with God that you should be obedient unto the end of your lives. That is what this is. Entering into the covenant to be obedient unto the end of your lives. Correct. That, that that's good context for the for this passage that we're reading. Mm -hmm. Which goes along how the, the covenant is for your um all. All the covenants, and we can talk about this, but um, before you enter baptism, you covenant to keep all his law. Not just part of it, all of it, right? Um, and the reason why that relates to here is because the law teaches us how to be like him. Because the gospel is about becoming like the Messiah, having it written upon our hearts, right? In fact... ENC 76 actually states, and I kind of like bringing this out. It, I know I'm sidetracking a little bit, but hopefully it's supportive in this idea that the gospel is about becoming in that. Um, DNC 76, uh, there it is, actually states if you follow a prophet, like just follow them, you're going to the telestial kingdom, which is the lowest. I mean, you're sorry, bad habit. You'll receive the telestial glory, which is the lowest glory, right? There is. And the glory of the telestial is one, and the glory of the stars is one. For the stars differ from another star in glory, even so that one from another in glory in the telestial world. For these are those who are of Paul, prophet, right? Or um, apostle. I think apostle more specifically, but anyways. Mm -hmm. Apollos, Apollo, Cephas. Cephas would be Peter. Okay. These are who are some of one or another, as in they're following a specific person, including the Messiah. And some of John, like John the Baptist, Moses, Elias, uh, Esaias, Isaiah, Enoch. Now, these two are not the same person. Um, but anyways, Enoch, um, we, but received not the gospel. See here, they're following these people, but didn't receive the gospel, neither the testimony of the Messiah, Yeshua the Messiah, neither the prophets, neither the everlasting gospel. Um, so, Oh, yeah, sorry. Everlasting covenant, which is the law. The covenant is the law, but... Um, it's also the doctrine. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, I, the I think they're related, the, but it's a little different, but anyways. I think, I think yeah, the, do, the, the doctrine is definitely... The doctrine is definitely... The, the doctrine is definitely the covenant, but the law... The, it's the law that shows us how to offer the broken heart and contrite spirit. And so... We, and it's the broken heart and contrite spirit that is the it's the broken heart and contrite spirit that is the beginning the the appropriate sacrifice um and that broken heart is an obedient heart the contrite spirit is a repentant spirit so so uh, I, 
Um, so I one one thing here. Here's the uh, the Isaiah that's from there. It's not Isaiah. It's from D and C eighty four, and it's list, and that is not Isaiah, right? Anyways, yeah. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. But one thing I I, I do find interesting. Okay, and, and this is you know musings of Stephen here. Um, so. Alma 34 talks about how what Yeshua did was an eternal sacrifice um, or infinite and yeah. eternal. Okay. That's his soul. Yeshua gave his soul for us. Okay? Um, and I see us having to have a broken heart and contrite spirit is pattern after that because that is giving our soul to him, giving up our will to him, which is making our soul in alignment with his ways instead of our ways. I see that as a type foreshadow of what he did for us is the way that I see it. Um, so anyways, um, okay, well, two things, um, okay. you know, when we get married, um, we take our husband's name upon us and we take it with us from then on. We are known by our husband's names. Um, when we, um, join a church. We are known by the name of that church. We're Methodists or we're Mormons or we're, you know. Um, but when we take upon us the name of Christ, we aren't known necessarily. I mean, we are to some extent, like by character, like you said, people start calling us Christians or, or some form of that. But... Mm -hmm. But we don't actually take it on the way we take on our husband's name. And I just I just feel like some something's missing. But so but what's I, even it, worse, what's even worse is that today somebody told me that they're now teaching that we take upon us the name of Jesus Christ every day when we get up and put on our garments. Um, well, so on the garments, I I believe that is of the occult. In fact, uh, Masons actually used to wear a garment, but they stopped doing that. That's another subject. So on, on the garments, I actually completely disagree because if anything, I disagree on their source. Um, but I, I, I believe as maybe we started looking here and we got a little sidetracked, taking the name of of the Messiah upon us, I do strongly believe it means we're taking upon the character and attributes well, of him. Um, and, that, and here's a, here's another thing. In, that makes sense. In the law, I mean, in well, okay, let's go to the parable, the, to one of the parable of the ten virgins. What does Jesus describe himself as? The bridegroom. Yeah. So when we enter into covenant with the Lord, we become the bride. And so we very in that in that way, we have to assume. I in my, I feel like we have to assume that we literally are taking His name upon us. In the same way that we would, in the same way that people do when they get married. So, like you're talking about in eternal realms, they refer to us that way. They would do they, uh, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm. It's oh. you, okay, Stephen. You want to? Yeah, yeah. So I think one, I'm, one, I think one, I'm running into my. I think I'm running into my own tongue. So um, let me go with this one first. I think I'll more go to um, what 
Sue's saying right there real quick, because uh, I have a thought from Lectures on Faith I want to bring out, but let's focus on what Sue just brought out. Okay, it's First Corinthians. So it, it, this is interesting here. And this is where translations become an issue here. So in First Corinthians 15, um, you'll, 22 through 28, you don't need the GST to see that there's three different glories during the resurrection. There's, there's three resurrections without the GST. And you can see that here, okay? Um, but, um, so every man in his own order, the anointed, the first fruits. So here, the translators put put Christ, which means the anointed, but most people, when they see that word Christ, especially capitalized, they're going to think of Jesus. I actually don't believe in this case, it's referring to the Messiah. I actually believe it's referring to those who have the celestial glory, who have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is the anointing. They've been anointed. Those who have received the, the, the baptism the of the Holy Spirit have been anointed. But Look at this. My point that I'm trying to bring out that I think goes along with what Sue's bringing out is that they're talked about the same way. The Messiah, a.k.a. the anointed, and first fruits, a.k.a. the, name. the Messiah. The, they, they have the, those the, two the, titles, names, applied to them. Those who have done, kept the law. After they've repented and came to him, they have those two same titles, those two same names, as which I think wow. would to answer Sue's questions there. And this wow. is talking about those who, uh, who have gained the first resurrection right there. Love it, man. Love it. Now, what, so, where was that again? Was uh, that first Corinthians 15, 22, 28. So here, I'll, I'll give you my chiasm for it. And with my little glyphs that help with the um, understandings, I'll give it in the group chat and I'll give it to you on Facebook. Okay, Sue. Um, and actually, that's coming up in a post that I'll maybe one day finish. <laughs> Sorry. I'm what? horrible. Not another one of those. Yeah, I have too many of those. I, I anyways, <laughs> but look, I'm sharing, right? I, yeah, so I felt like there I'm hiding it and I'm trying to share it as. It comes as up, needed. right? As needed. So I, I, I don't hide this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so I, on the other thought, on the lectures on faith part, which does not directly answer Sue's question, but I think it is related, is, and I was trying to find it, and I'm having a hard time, but I think it's lectures on faith. It five and maybe seven this is where i don't have it all memorized but it talks about how unless we're like the prototype oh maybe it's prototype i want to find ah uh, here we go this is the one i want <laughs> I'm, I'm remembering as i'm speaking here um but unless we're like the prototype to be saved we won't be saved so and what um, constitute and what constitutes the real difference between a saved person and one not saved is the difference in the degree of their faith. One's faith has become perfect enough to lay hold upon eternal life, and the other's is not. But to be a little more particular, let us ask, where shall we find a prototype unto the, into the, whose likeness we may be assimilated in order that we may be made partakers of life and salvation? In other words, where shall we find a saved being? For if we find a saved being, we may ascertain without much difficulty, what all others must be in order to be saved. They must be like that individual or they cannot be saved. And there that individual know. That is, is the character, right? Which, when we, which another way of saying that is the name. We are called by his name, his character. And we, shall and be, that's, we will recognize him because we will be like him. And as we repent and we walk in his ways, his image becomes everlastingly burned on our countenances. Right. In fact, lectures on faith, actually, um, I'm pretty sure that's verse two near the end that actually even states that. Right. Yeah. Yep. 
Trans causing, being transformed. Possessing the same mind, right? Meaning, and the mind is the law, his plan, his purposes. Um, being transformed into the same image or likeness, even the express image of whom who fulfills all in all, being filled with the fullness of his glory. And that is the mm -hmm. celestial kingdom. I mean, we can go look at the, de or, sorry, celestial glory, bad habit, sorry. <laughs> and become one in him, even as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. So, um, but back to five, I, I did remember the, I mean, seven, I did remember the section, right? I just forgot the, I remembered the wrong word to look on, prototype. <laughs> um, but all those who are saved are going to be like the Messiah, have the same character and attributes as he has. Which name is a Hebrew idiom for character? And Thank I, you. Yeah, Oh, I've been ahead. asking that question for years and never got this. Nobody ever had the answer before. And they make up all kinds of things because they don't have the answer. They make up all kinds of things to excuse why they don't have the answer. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, it's so um, maybe you'll like this post more now, <laughs> but um, it's right here. And, and, and as we started reading, I, 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 as we're interjecting and expounding it, as Zach was reading some of it, it's right here in the Book of Mormon. It's in Hebrew idioms. It's in the 1828 dictionary. It's just which is yeah. which is what I've been which is what I've been trying to tell people is that we have to read the Book of Mormon as if we were Hebrews. Yes, and we have Amen. to read, and we have to read the Bible and the New Testament as if we were Hebrews, not Greeks. So I, I just want to bring out the, the definition of Hebrew means crossed over. Abraham was a Hebrew because he crossed over from the pagan Gentile world into Yahweh's world. We need to do the same. There's no, there's no shame in being Yashadel. No. Uh, in fact, there's glory in it <laughs> if you're if that's going to be your motivation but um yeah. a lot of my motivation is understanding and peace that's actually my motivation but every, everybody's slightly different whatever your motivation is that's fine right um the, no, the main but, point i mean for, for me my mo for me my motivation is the same as what it was when i first started on this kick on the law to see the face of Christ. No. And that not in vision, but in reality, in my flesh. That is the quest. That is the goal. That is the objective to know my Lord. I have the same goal fall, to see him fall down face on to his, face fall, in the flesh. To fall down at his feet and bathe his feet in my tears of gratitude. Yeah. Amen, brother. Because he saved a wretch like me. Well, you're not the only wretch he saved. So uh, yep. I, I'm up there right with you. And I'm very appreciative of it. Of it. Um, so I, I, I don't know, uh, Sue, if you want us to keep reading Mosiah 5, um, or I maybe that was it. enough to answer your question, but Mosiah um, 5, I need to write that. Yeah. So I, I gave you the link to the post, um, yeah. read it in the chapter. My main point for bringing out the post is because it's got the glyphs and the hyperlinks to help you see it, that it's right there in the chapter. If you know how to Bring it out okay and so the gliss is partly and now i do yeah because like <laughs> even blotted out you go look at that it's you know i even giving the di dictionary link to it it's um it's to be erased forgotten right which kind of sounds like hell <laughs> but anyways th th there's there's a lot to this 
Um, and so I, I don't spend a whole time expounding every point on here, but hopefully at least the quick glyphs and quick slash notes on it and the links help bring it out for some people. Sure. Um, so, all right. Well, if that's, unless someone else really wants to get into these details more, we can go on to another subject um, since we pretty much answered it for Sue already. Yeah. <laughs> No, okay. A so, question that I didn't think had an answer. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I mean, well, one that would satisfy me because I've been asking for years. Well, I'm glad we could help with that. Sue. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, if no one else has something real quick, I, I, I have a couple thoughts I could share in the real quick that maybe we can lead into other things. So, oh. um, it, so we've talked about church government occasionally here, uh, and that's an important thing. So one thing, uh, I, I don't have any specific verses to, to bring out, um, but we can probably look them up real quick. But there is um, two parts to the government of God. There's one for the actual church, and then there's one for the missionary work, right? And mm -hmm. in the DNC, in fact, maybe I'll bring up my notes just to kind of show this a little bit. Um, the DNC talks about how um, the traveling 12 apostles um, and the first presidency have this equal power. Okay. So let me find that because I don't. Equal and sorry, that's going to be it. Okay, so 107. Um, you want to read a little bit, Kesley, or is it going to be too small on the phone for you? You're muted, so I didn't hear you. Yeah, I think I can read it. Okay, so here, here's, here's probably some good ones to start with, and maybe I can read some after the 107s. Okay. Okay. Um, the 12 traveling counselors are called to be the 12 apostles or special witnesses of the name of Christ in all the world, thus differing from other officers in the church in the duties of their calling. So, so and they look, form different in the officers in the church, okay, versus because it's kind of starting to bring out that they're um, missionary, aka outside the church dealing with non believers. Their authority is in the world. Correct. Not the church. Yeah. Okay. And they form a quorum equal in authority and power to the three presidents previously mentioned. Right. The equal seven in power in for a different group of people. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. okay. Um, the 70 are also called to preach the gospel and to be a special witnesses unto the Gentiles and in all the world. Uh, That's see, different. That. That's to the world, not the church. And it's continuing because mm -hmm. the 70 are helpers to the traveling 12. So if anything, you call these the traveling 70. I, it, it doesn't word it that way, but I, I think it would be fine to add that word. Okay. Thus differing from other officers in the church in the duties of their calling. So uh, let's look at this. Differing from the officers in the church, same basic wording that was up there about the traveling 12, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think 26. Okay. And they form a quorum equal in authority to that of the 12 special witnesses or apostles just named. So the 70 have equal authority as the 12, which is something that's not practiced in not today. today. Um, in, in fact, in all restoration, restoration churches that I know of, they make the 12 ahead of the church instead of the world, right? Um, but anyways. Okay. Okay. And uh, and I actually have I actually have the scripture that shows that this organization, the separate organization of the missionaries and the uh, and the church itself, them having them being like two separate kind of things. Okay, so let, let's let's finish one hundred and seven, and then we'll go to that. Okay, 
because yep. um, X15 cool. is a good one for that too. It, that's what that's what I I pulled it up. Oh, okay. So yeah, because X15 actually does show the separate um, duties, one for the church and one for the um, mm -hmm. world too. Uh, yep. And so we'll, let's well let's finish reading finish this and go X15 because I I actually want to bring something out, but um, anyways. That's well, X15. Yeah, Acts yeah. 15. Um, it, it's a big one. Acts 15 is mostly famous for the decisions what to do with the new converts, right? Yeah. Um, but it, it has more to it than just that part. It's the minutia of it really brings out how the restoration and what's revealed in the DNC is actually true because it's an it's an example of this. And we can well look at the verse that Ben wants to from that on that. But let's let's finish this a little bit. So I think yep, we're yep, on yep. 27. Yep, okay. Yep. And every decision made by either of these quorums must be by the unanimous voice of the same. That is, every member in each quorum must be agreed to its decisions in order to make their decisions of the same power or validity one with the other. Okay, so I, I just want to say one thing. I, I know one thing that happens in the LDS Church, even when they're not in agreement, they actually have legal agreements that states that they have to act if they are in agreement, even when they are not. A lot of that's going to be based off of this, but it's it's doing the show instead of the actual intent. Um, mm -hmm. the, the one thing that I, a general pattern I see um, is that Satan cares about appearances than actual realities Yeah, the heart. And so they have appearance of being unanimous una and equal, or I mean, unanimous in their decisions even though that they're not um so i wonder if it's because they're pattern off of who they follow but anyways um 28 okay a majority may form a quorum when circumstances render it impossible to be otherwise okay and so if they all can't get together right uh 36 okay the Standing High Councils at the Stakes of Zion form a quorum equal in authority in the affairs of the church in all their decisions to the quorum of the presidency or to the traveling high council. So look how they're equal in authority. Um, but here, this can be a little confusing if you don't understand the principle behind of the church versus the world here, because the first presidency and the Standing High Council have to do with Stake of Zion, which is the church, and the quorum of the presidency, or the traveling high council. Um, so this, we don't have any more. And so this is where, this is not the traveling 12. So I got a little confused initially. Sorry about that. But th that is, uh, actually, the traveling high council is the church. It's a calling in the church. Uh, and the earliest church doesn't have that anymore, actually. Um but uh, anyways, so 37. You're muted, Kelsey. All right, my little girl, she's still she's still getting strep, so oh. she's kind of loud right now. Okay. So I'm gonna move for a second. Okay. Well, um, um, should I pause or are we good now? Um uh yeah, can you pause for just a second? Yeah, yeah okay so we were uh we just finished the last the scripture seven um that's that's probably good on that one um so maybe let's go to um acts 15 that you were bringing up that actually shows an, an example of the separations of power in that um you yeah let me get that up because it's one of my favorite chapters my favorite example for this because that chapter is good for a lot of things, actually, especially um, in wanting to keep Torah. It's good for that one, too. But anyways, mm -hmm. we'll do it for the leadership right now. Acts um, 15. Do you know which verse you're thinking of? We'll start in verse 6 and go and okay. go on. Down. And the apostles and the elders came together for to consider of this matter. We're talking okay, so about real quick. So this is the the world. The apostles, the elders, is the church. Yep, yep. 
And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Okay, and so God, I, I, which, hold on, I, I'm, I'm going to interject a little bit. But so this is talking about Acts 10 here, which mm -hmm. gets misinterpreted a lot. It's about my uh, word. Yahweh telling Peter to let go of your false traditions and not going to the Gentiles, a.k.a. the non-believers. And what is... I don't know yeah. how many times I've had to explain that one. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, you can just read Acts 10 and Acts 11, and it tells... And Peter tells us what it's about. It was about going to the people, right? In fact, yeah. uh, just on that point, in the Old Testament, Tanakh, it is common to refer to groups of people by animals. In fact, mm -hmm. I'm Ephraim. I'm referred to as an ox, right? Mm -hmm. Even just the, and I mean, that one's kosher, but there's other ones. For example, Daniel's visions dealt with group of people that were of described as animals, right? It, that's not an unusual thing, okay? But mm -hmm. anyways, but here is Elohim telling Peter, who is supposed to go to the non-believers, here's a, a group of non-believers that you need to go to so that they will start joining the church. Okay, go ahead, Zach. Like, um, is this is this one of the scriptures that no, along along with the what's it called? Like, Yeshua is telling Peter that. On this rock, you're going to build my church. Is this mm -hmm. one of the scriptures that that the Catholics used to? No, that that one's know? different. And and yeah, people... the Catholics the Catholics don't like this scripture. They don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, most people don't know what to do with this chapter because there's tons of arguments over what's actually in it and what it's teaching. But on on the yeah. one about build upon this rock, um, that's Revelation um and testimony in the messiah because if it was in a person um I, I know we're in a culture that likes their pronouns but even in today with their silly pronoun garbage they don't ever use a pronoun this for a person right right this is used for an inanimate object if it was actual peter it would be upon you not this but uh, that yeah, but that the reason that's actually uh, that's act, in Hebrew that's actually brilliant wordplay. And thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. In Hebrew, that's brilliant wordplay. So um, uh, sure, because the words, words the, play, the words the words are the same. Um, words there sound is almost play the same. going on there. Uh, well, there. Uh, so Peter actually means uh, pebble more than rock, and it was mm -hmm. actually rock in Hebrew. So it would be pebble versus a rock okay yeah um but rock also has a symbolic meaning of revelation and mm -hmm. yeshua okay and there's a quote from joseph smith that i believe is authentic that brings that out also but we're sidetracking i don't want to go too much on that one um if that's okay. okay okay so where were we and uh, believe or yeah I, I think we just did seven i think okay Okay. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. Yeah, and that goes along with um, what happens in Acts 10 and 11, okay. right? Because mm -hmm. they, who can, they who were can withhold what, them, who right? can hold Who can withhold water that these may be baptized, seeing as they have received the Holy Ghost, even like unto us? Uh, that's in 10. Uh, and put no difference between them and us, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Okay, so this yoke, that's the oral law, okay? Yeah. Okay, th there's a and it's also, it's also, uh, yeah, well, they were able to bear circumcision, so that can't be, so that well, can't it's, be. It's not talking about circumcision. This is talking about uh, the oral law right there. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Because... Uh, with all these, so <laughs> you go look at the books, 
that have the oral law, mm -hmm. it's that big. Yeah, <laughs> nobody could. That yeah. is that law is impossible to keep. Um, in fact, there's even laws in it about um, when you wake up, what the order of the shoes that you have to put on your feet and the order that you have to tie them. It, it's ridiculous. Okay. Yes, it's you must put on law. first your right shoe, then you must put on your left shoe, then you must tie your left shoe, and then your right shoe. Yeah. I, I'm not kidding. That's in the oral law. That's in the oral law. Yeah. Um, not to mention when you, when the scriptures talk about the written law, that it, we are able to keep it, right? Yes. And in fact, Yeshua even commands us to keep it, right? But anyways, I, I'm just trying to bring out how uh, there's a lot of confusions in these statements here. Uh, and a lot of it is because but that yoke, not knowing yeah, that, culture or scriptures enough. And so I'm trying to help make it a little easier mm -hmm. to understand. Okay. Yeah. In order to understand a lot of these things, you need to understand the principle, uh, the key tenets of Phariseeism. Yes. And also the, the controversies that were going on at this time also. Right. Yes. Um, yes. And so I'm just trying to bring these things out. I, I'm, I'm not, hopefully as I'm, bringing it out and, and and Ben and I are bringing these things out it's obvious as we bring it out where you might not have noticed it on your own right um but anyways but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved we shall be saved even as they that's interesting then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them Okay, so there we, now we've had the apostles all give their witness. Then everybody sits down, and who stands up? James, James, brother yeah. of Jesus. Right, right. But okay, just in case those who don't know, who what is James' position? He is the head bishop, aka first presidency. He is the bishop. He is the bishop of Jerusalem. Yeah, and he is the one that makes the decision. It's the church, not the apostles, that made the decision. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written. After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. So I just want to bring up this this Simon. That's a translation of Peter. So that yep. So it's just referring to how Peter was just talking, but it's a little confusing yep. because of this. And then build up the kingdom of David. That's the Jews, right? Mm -hmm. David is Jew. That's the line of, which is, the line of David is Yeshua, and Yeshua is a actual little of Judah, right? But anyways, which but is the residue. Of Yep, sorry. You were no, I'm just saying he, he those were it, it, at the beginning. This gets into Daniel 70 prophecies still a little bit, but after Yeshua died for three and a half years, they only focused on the Jews. And so that's who James is talking about is those those converts of the Jews of Judah, David, during those the, that first three and a half years. After that three and a half years, the end of the last seven year, uh, mm -hmm. they then started going to the Gentiles. Okay? Which is which is referenced here in verse 17, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles yeah. upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world, wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them from which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions so, of idols. Uh, real quick. Wherefore my sentence is, as in here is what the, the judgment. decision is. Here's the judgment. Because in, in, in United States courts, uh, generally speaking, a sentence is applied to a criminal as their punishment, right? Mm -hmm. Here is this is this, this is what my judgment is. Here is the decision. And this who's speaking here? It's still James. James, the head bishop is the one that's making the decision which is the church versus the apostles who are to the world they 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 came and counseled and helped talk about it 
and gave their witness something they actually saw to help the, the discussion going. But who made the actual decision? It was the church, not the apostles. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Okay, so I want to, um, uh, you know, idols, fornication, sexual stuff. Uh, and this is kosher. Mm -hmm. And then there's one more coming up. I'll let For Moses up. of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So, so here's three things to do right away. Right? Get rid of your idols. Stop doing your sexual sins and start eating kosher. And then in, on top of that, Every Sabbath, go learn your Torah and, and start keeping Jews, more as you learn it. And the Jews practiced a loony solar Sabbath at the time yes, of Christ. they did. Um, that's a whole other subject, but yes. Um, so, which is what today is, right? But anyways. Um, I, then it pleased the apostles and so the missionaries and the church. Oh, me and my double clicking. Elders. The whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barinus, namely Judas, surname Barabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters. So here's what James said. And now it's talking about now we're going to go tell everybody what was decided by the head bishop, not the apostle. The apostles didn't decide. All right. It was the head bishop, James. And then when he's done, they, they're, they're describing how they're now they're going to go tell everybody this decision that the head bishop made. So I, I, unless Ben has more in this specifically. No, this is, read, that's, actually, that's, that's actually, that actually illustrates, I mean, that whole thing right through there just illustrates perfectly how the governance of how, how Jesus Christ runs his church right it, it it shows it's not the apostles yeah the apostles are just out there witnessing to the world they're supposed to be that powerful witness that over that push it over the top kind of yeah they're the ones that are to bring people into the church they have mm -hmm. no authority in the church just as what we read in dnc 107 uh and uh saw here in the example in acts 15 okay so um main point for getting to that is to show that there's there's two divisions there's the church and then there's the missionary work okay which is a whole branch of its own thing completely separate from the church now um in the church the leaders the male leaders need to be married okay in the missionary field, they do not need to be married. In fact, Paul even somewhat suggests that they shouldn't be married, but it's not a, an exact um, dictate. It's just kind of preferred not to. And I think some of that is symbolic, which I'll get to in a minute, and some of it just logistics of it because of what they're supposed to be doing. But anyways, so the symbolic thing I want to bring out, it's interesting to me. Those leaders who are in the church are bound to the church, and wives are symbolic of the church. So leaders in the church are bound to a wife that represents a church. The missionary efforts are not bound to the church, and they're not married. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to bring out? Yeah, that makes sense. And so I, I do think on the missionary effort, there's some logistics to go along with why just practicalities is like that. But um, on the church side, where they are bound to the church, they are actually supposed to be married, bound to a wife. Um, so I, I think that's pretty cool myself. Anyways. Yeah, that's a, yeah. So um, 
I have another thing I could share if you guys want, or if if somebody else has something they want to share. Um, that I the main reason I would share this one is because it's somewhat related to this one. So, um, I guess I'll share it real quick. So, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, with the history of Isaac, Esau, um, Jacob, and Rebecca, right? There's, I, f I forget what chapter in Acts it is, but we could probably look it up real quick. But I'm just going to do this pretty quick, but we can go read it if we want. That, um, Rachel, no, Rebecca, sorry, it's Rebecca, not Rachel. Um, right? It's Rebecca, isn't it? For Jacob? No, or Isaac. for Isaac's wife. It's Rebecca. Yeah, Rebecca. It's Rebecca. Okay, so my first recollection is correct. Um, but when it came time for Isaac giving the blessing, uh, Rebecca um, told Jacob what to do and told him to disguise like his brother Esau, right? Um, so what I see in that is the church, Rebecca, teaching the followers, Jacob, how to become like Esau, the son, who, because we, we become more, because we become like the son, that will be blessed by Isaac, the father. And so the reason I'm bringing it up right now is because of the really church cool. wife analogy I brought for the, the church and the missionary stuff. And here I see it here with Rebecca. And I, I know it may not be presented the best way and a lot of interesting interpretations out there. But Rebecca, who represents the church, was teaching Jacob, a follower, how to look like or act like have the character of the name of Isaac who represents the first. yeah re Actually, represents the firstborn the son in fact you could even get into the point where oh um, that's that's freaking awesome Isaac loved Esau the most because of the meat that he did now the meat when you compare that to the scriptures symbolism is that that is the deep meaning of the scriptures right and he's the one that did that it was cool. when it comes to jacob and rebecca it was rebecca the church that prepared the meat for the son jacob to give to the father because he was not quite learned enough himself to present it to the father as in the church is supposed to, to teach us to be like the son so that way we can get the blessings from the father wow in fact when we become like the son what do we get we get that power that we talked about in the non-recording section and that's described by the hair authority on the arms the power mm -hmm. and yeah. even the smell right because the smell has to do with our righteousness and our prayers also. Oh, yes, the prayers in Revelation, sweet savor. Yep, yeah. yep. Because the Father smelt him and not just touched him. Yep. Um, but anyways. Wow. That's cool. The, the, yeah. the imagery, when read correctly, it really points to how we be, we're taught to be like the sun. Yeah, and so uh, you know, it's it's really interesting. The, the the thing that I find really interesting with these stories of the patriarchs and the scriptures, if you're just le reading them as simply literal history, they get they can be kind of confusing. But when you look at them for the metaphors that are within them, and the wonderful the wonderful symbolism that they teach, and what they teach by symbol, I mean, you know, what they teach by symbolism. It's really 
the Lord's teaching us the gospel through the lives of these imperfect men. Yeah, uh, and I, I think that, so I do believe they're literal, okay? But I would say that the way that they're crafted teaches us the deeper meaning that we're supposed to be getting. Yeah, well, I'm not saying they're not literal. I'm just saying but that when a, we- A lot of people just focus just on the literal portion of it. And then they make mm -hmm. excuses because they'll make excuses, you know, how Rebecca kind of did deceiving- right but that's really not what's going on and or it should not be what's being focused on what should be focused on is what it's teaching behind the scenes and how it's the church that's teaching the followers how to become like the son so that they can get blessed by the father mm -hmm. in fact even to the point where the church prepares the meat the deeper stuff to be enjoyed right um mm -hmm. so but anyways, it's I, it, that was awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. I know we didn't read the scriptures to go along with it, but I, I know I, I think most of us are familiar with it enough that we can go read it on our own now and and have it open along. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm going right. to see that whenever I read that. <laughs> now you've just ruined another scripture story for me, Stephen. Uh, I hopefully no, I'm being joking. sarcastic a little bit there, but yeah. <laughs> um, when Yeshua stated in the New Testament that the Old Testament points to him, he was telling the truth. He literally was telling the truth. It does. I I, I just gave I'm, out I'm some quick shock. highlights on how that story or that history does point to him, right? I'm going to shock some people. I'm going to say the apostles proved the gospel from the scriptures. Which was the Old Testament. The Old Testament. Which... The apostles proved the gospel from the Old Testament. Yeah. In fact, uh, Alma 37 is an important prophecy that goes along with that. It states that the brass plates which is basically the old testament tanakh is coming back and it will bring people to repentance because mm -hmm. what's still what's in it the old testament is still valid because mm -hmm. why would you repent of something that's not valid anymore you wouldn't that's that's crazy talk it's bringing back to their repentance because it's still valid and i don't think in anybody's head that they could justify that the Old Testament does not teach us to keep Torah. That that would be that would be literally crazy. When I'm saying it, I am. I'm just being silly. But that would be literally be crazy, right? Yeah. Um, we, uh, I, yeah. Uh, I'd be like, okay, I'm done talking to you. <laughs> You're insane. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't really know anybody that would claim that the Old Testament doesn't teach to keep Torah. And well, that's my, um, literally Alma 37 is saying that the brass plates, Old Testament, um, plus or minus a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, in both cases, there's plus and minus there, um, is coming back and it's going to bring people to repentance. Uh, and the other, yeah, but yeah, that. <laughs> well this is what and this is also one of the things that's always perplexed me about these arguments that people have against the law uh, it is um okay so for the first four thousand years or so satan was tempting people to break the law and now for the next two thousand years he's going to tempt us to keep the law yeah it's just silly talk <laughs> 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 Not to mention in, in Revelations, I forget the chapter, but it, you know, Satan's going to be after those who have a testimony of the Messiah and who keep the law, <laughs> right? which yep. is Torah. Um, but anyways. Well, I think I, I have been deeply, I have been greatly edified this night. I hope, uh, I hope everybody else has too. I'm, well, before I'm, we go, is there anything anybody else wants to share? Just so everybody oh, yes, has a, yes. a chance. No? Okay. Uh, it's probably um, a good time to call it a night then. 
Um, yeah. Well, Shabbat I just, shalom. Uh, oh, go ahead. Shabbat shalom. It is a pleasure to be able to gather with you all every Sabbath yeah. or as many Sabbaths as we can come together. Mm -hmm. So uh, don't go anywhere. Let me pause. Okay. <laughs>